And good morning to those of you who are joining us by live stream uh, this morning. Messiah, we've lit in four candles this morning. The last one that we uh, lit this morning was the candle of love. Where is Jesus now? Where, where is Jesus? We uh, take and set aside this time to recall Jesus' birth. We recall His uh, coming as a baby, being born. But where is He now? I mean, He is alive. So geographically speaking, where is He? And before you think that that's just an outlandish question, I want to let you know that my chiropractor actually asked me that question. Uh, I, of course, I, moving here, I had to reestablish different uh, uh, connections, and uh, because of uh, my uh, sports activities and maybe because I'm getting a bit older, uh, I need to make sure I have proper medical attention once in a while, so I uh, established a, a place uh, to go for uh, my chiropractor, and uh, after a short time of conversation and in the midst of acupuncture, he asked me uh, about that question. Like, so where is Jesus? And I'm not sure how you would answer that. Maybe if you were like me, you would say, well, he's in heaven. Or maybe if you are familiar with some scripture passages, you would hear that Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I'm in their midst. But there's more going on. And, and Jesus actually talks about this. This morning, I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. It's about uh, 14, 15 verses. For some of you, it will be familiar. But what I want you to do when I'm reading this is uh, on your uh, bulletin or on a sheet of paper at home, I want you to also consider what is it that you notice particularly? What do you notice? And what are some of the feelings that come up and arise as I read this, what are some things that you, that you feel, some, some feelings that you have as I read this, this morning? And so, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, the first gospel of Matthew chapter 25, and I'm going to start reading at verse 31. And I'm going to read all the way to the end of the chapter, to verse 46. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him. Then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at His right hand, Come, you that are blessed by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, uh, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when, when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you were naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We are recalling these four weeks what we call Advent. It is the waiting. 
the anticipation. And really what we are doing is we are anticipating when Jesus will come again, when Jesus will return, not as a baby, but now as a king, as an adult in all His glory. And that is in part what He is describing here. What is de- Jesus is describing here is His second coming, His return. And what He's describing is a form of what we could call judgment. Judgment is a technical term which means a time of decision. It is a time when decisions are made. And what it is clear in Jesus' uh, teaching here is that what happens now here in our lives on earth actually matters. And to be clear, this is not about salvation in the sense that we can earn or we merit salvation. We know through many passages, John 3.16, the popular one, John 5, For those who received Him, who believed in His name, He gave the power to become children of God. So it is through believing and receiving Jesus as Lord that we have eternal life. But what Jesus is saying here is that there are uh, indications of being a follower of Jesus. Being a follower of Jesus shows up here and now in the way we live our life, and particularly how we relate to people, how we relate to people who are strangers, how we relate to people who are in need of food or clothing or people who are sick or people who are in prison. But what's interesting to me is, why would Jesus say this thousands of years before His actual return? He was saying this in about 30 A.D., like nearly 2,000 years ago, and it's still here today, and it might last for a long while yet. We don't know. So why would he say this so long in advance? Well, if you were looking, if you wrote down some of the things that you were uh, noticed or some of the feelings, maybe in your, in your notes, maybe uh, at home as well, you were writing these things down. If you look at that, maybe as you were hearing this, you're, one of the feelings you might have is a, a sense of maybe Uh, of guilt, or concern, or fear, or anxiety, or confidence, or these sorts of things, as you hear this and you go, hmm, is that me? Is that us? Is that... But I can tell you that that is not the reason why Jesus is, is saying this so far in advance. He is not saying this because He wants to motivate people uh, by fear, or by guilt, or by shame. What he's doing is he's actually explaining and revealing what that second coming will be like. He's giving us fair and for uh, explanation as to what that will be like. It's a form of revelation. It's a form of explanation so that we actually have the information well in advance. But what else do you notice? Is that Where is Jesus? Where is He saying He is? See, this is actually about Jesus and where He says He is. And it's about relationships particularly. And so when people ask us this question, and when you think about this question, where is Jesus? I mean, we can sit in the abstract, or we can actually get pretty concrete with it and pretty specific with it, from this point on, when Jesus says this, and from this point on, we can have an answer as to where Jesus says He is, and who He identifies with, and how we can relate to Him. And what Jesus is saying is, that Jesus is among the marginalized. Jesus is among the marginalized. He calls them his family. In fact, he so identifies with them. It isn't exclusively, he isn't exclusively there, but he is especially there. And he is no less present today, although somewhat hidden to us. And he is with the discounted And the disenfranchised. And this is where he identifies and where he says he is. 
in a word, he is very near. Christ Jesus is near us. He is in our neighborhoods. He is at the grocery store. He is in the place where we go to pick up groceries or when we are downtown in Calgary. He is very near. And yes, he is also at the right hand of the Father. When we recall the Advent story, we begin at the beginning of Matthew. In chapter 1, and verse 23, it says, Behold, the virgin Mary will conceive and bear a son, and they will give him the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I want you to notice several things there. When we recall this, we recall how Joseph and Mary were outcasts. They were marginalized. They were discounted. There wasn't a lot of space or room for them, very literally. He was identifying. He was literally coming into uh, human existence and coming to earth in a social economic fabric that was lowly and marginalized and discounted. And as we come near to Him and approach Him in that sense, we get a sense of His divine love. And you know, a while back, uh, Reese and I were talking about this song where we had this lyric, um, you know, reckless love. And I was trying to figure out what that means. And really what it means is there's this extravagant kind of love, this e enormous love uh, that is a reaching love and a, an empathetic love that He comes in this way. But I wonder when we think of that Emmanuel God with us, I think maybe there's a tendency for us to just say, well, that's because when Jesus is born and we say, well, yeah, it makes sense, God with us, as in he's there, and we kind of just keep it to God with us, God, you know, Jesus in this physical, and we kind of lock it in and we stay there. But his mode of operation, his promise is that he's with us, and the way he comes is through this lowly, marginalized environment. He identifies with them. Those are actually his human family members. But then as we go to the end of the book of Matthew, in chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Then he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And what? I will be with you always. I mean, that's not just abstract or theoretical. It's a promise. It's actually who He is. It's, it's His very being to be with us, to be in relationship with us. And when we are with what we would call the least of these, when we are with the marginalized, the discounted, the disenfranchised, we are actually opening up space for a direct encounter with the living Lord Jesus Christ. When we spend time, when we take time to be with somebody who the world considers to be marginalized or discounted or not worth very much, when we do that, we are opening up space for a direct encounter with Jesus Christ. It's a promise and an opportunity that we have. So rather than something, when we do something for somebody, we can do something with somebody. You know what's interesting is when Jesus describes this, he says that the people that were doing that, they said that they didn't notice. They were like, well, when did we do that? When, when were we with someone who was sick? When did we, we don't really recall, we don't really remember. Because for them, it was a matter of course. It was a matter of everyday life. It had become habitual and ordinary and regular and a course of life. It's not easy. 
When we were living in Toronto, and I would go downtown, I'd take the train downtown, and, and I would walk from the Union Station to one of my offices downtown, I would pass lots of people on the street who were, uh, had their hands open and were wanting money. And it was actually Kimberly who was uh, encouraging me, saying, Gary, just put a pocket full of toonies and loonies, and as you go, just, just do that and start building a rapport. And so I was, yeah, so I just started, you know, started building relationship. There were some that were like regular on my, my route that I began to, to know and get to know their names and what their stories were and started to hear from them. And I will tell you that, yes, there were times when I was praying, Lord, like this is so expensive. Lord, and then I would, sometimes I'd think I'm going to take a different route, you know? What I'm missing, what we miss is that it's an opportunity to meet and have a, have a, a, a connection with the living Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what he's inviting there. So actually, all of this, even now, as we read this passage in Matthew 25, is not a threat. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to be with. It's actually Jesus' invitation to be with him. It's what I would call withness, an invitation to withness. He's saying, be with them and you will be with me. If you want to be with me, be with them. The vision statement that we rolled out a few months ago has four key words. Belong, abide, Become, extend. B-A, B-E. Belong, a diverse group of people with a deep sense of belonging. United in God's love. With a deep sense of belonging. So that means relationship. And then the E at the end is living out the gospel, living out God's love and extending His love. Extend His love to the world. We are by our very design beings that require relationship. And we do not remain static. We are changed through relationships. And we have this opportunity to have relationships and build friendships and acquaintances with a variety of people, but in so doing, drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord Jesus. In Romans 12, verse 15, he says, uh, Paul writes, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. In Galatians, he says, uh, Let us consider how to do good to everyone, especially to those who are the household of the faith. And so here in our congregation, it begins here. This is kind of like to maybe use a football analogy. This is kind of like the huddle where we get together, we gather together, where Jesus is the audience and we learn and we build relationship and we practice the idea of fellowship together. We practice relationship together, how to show love and concern and care for each other. So it actually means is, you know, practicing that means that we don't just zip out the door at the end of a worship service, that we can build a connection. And I know that there are extroverts and introverts, and everybody needs to be patient with each other. Some enjoy lots of people. Some would rather just talk to one person. And all of that is, we have space for all of that. But we practice here, and we learn here, and we develop that here. But then the second part is this sort of dotted circle, and we're going to learn more about these circles in the coming uh, year in January. But this dotted circle, which we call our community groups, or our life groups, where some of you gather together in your homes and in your neighborhoods together. And you provide care and you study together. But what I wonder... And here's another opportunity. What I wonder is, are those community groups closed groups? Or are they open groups where we also, in those community groups, consider other people, a neighbor, a friend? So if it is a closed group, then really it is a closed friendship group. 
But what if it was a sort of a perforated, a porous group where once in a while, maybe you change the format and a neighbor or some friends could also be part of the blessings that you're having? Or what if as a community group you said, this week when we meet, instead of us meeting together, how about we, we, we disperse and each of us meets with a neighbor, a friend, or somebody else. And that's going to be our community group this week, this month. It really stretches our minds. You know, when Kimberly and I were visiting some, uh, a, a couple friend of ours in Niyoki in the Congo, sort of quite deep into the Congo, and we were in this, Niyoki is about 40,000. Well, it kind of depends, you know, but let's say it's about 40,000. And we were in this sort of simple little restaurant uh, having something to eat. And there was the four of us sitting around a table, and we were really enjoying each other's company and fellowship and talking. And then there were some other uh, people that were actually workers. They had been doing some work on our friend's house to try and get it ready. And they were over here. And Charity said to us, you know, this is really, like, to Kimberly and I, John and Charity were there with us. And Charity said, you know, this is really good, isn't it? And we're like, yeah, this is good. And we're really feeling blessed to be together. And here we are. And Charity said, well, how about we share that blessing with the table beside us? Why don't we like, just open up and share that blessing? And it's so counter-conventional, so counter-cultural to us, but not, it doesn't have to be. And so we just opened our chairs up a little bit. And then in, I don't know, was it French or Magala or Chokwe? I can't remember. They speak several languages. But then she just started t having a conversation across to the other table. And very naturally, they just kind of swiveled a bit. And we started having this conversation. And then they started asking questions like, about Jesus, and at the time they were asking even about like Mennonite or Baptist. What is that? What's going on? And we had an opportunity just to connect. But there's this other sort of half circle because there's also when we go to your place of work or when you go to the grocery store or to the hockey rink or curling rink or, or, or the nursery or wherever it is, there's also that opportunity to connect with people and to open up space for a direct encounter with the living Lord Jesus Christ. You can encounter the living Jesus in these places as well. And yes, we do hampers, and that's good, and, and that's kind of here and there. But what we're talking about is what happens as we go, because Jesus is making an invitation. He's asking and making an invitation to meet Him, a direct encounter with the living Jesus, with the marginalized people in our neighborhoods and our communities. And so I wonder, as I conclude here, I'm going to bring some chairs up here. What I wonder is, could it be that this begins to mark an alternative advent? Could it be that this season begins to mark an alternative advent where we have realized through the last couple of years just how important community and how important being with somebody else really is? And parents and guardians, maybe this is an opportunity to teach your children about presence with a C-E, even more than presence. It's nice to give a present because we do consider other people. It points us away from ourselves, and, and we do that, and that's nice. But also presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. The value of presence, the value of being with somebody. Young people, teenagers, young adults, any gadget, widget, or material thing is kind of nice, but will ultimately be disappointing. What you really know and realize is the value of presence. And you have it to give somebody. And that is Jesus' invitation, an invitation to a real encounter with the living Lord Jesus Christ through withness.